Well, I'll never forget the scariest moment of my life. It was about 12 years ago, July 17th, 2007. And it was about 11.44 in the morning. And lucky for you, I have a picture of this, okay? So I brought it with me today, and I want you all to see. That's me in Jinja, Uganda, Africa, getting ready to bungee jump. Now, I am terrified of heights, okay? So don't let this smile fool you, okay? Like, I was not happy to make it worse. That's the Nile River, y'all, okay? And the day before I went bungee jumping, we had gone on a safari and been in the Nile River on a boat and saw that this is crocodile-infested waters, okay? So, so here I am, scared of heights, over the Nile River, in Africa, getting ready to bungee jump, and I was petrified, terrified, thought for sure, it all ends today, right? I just had a son. He was six months old back here in America. And I thought, like, I'm being a bad dad already. Like risking my, he's going to grow up with a, without a father, right? <laughs> and, and so you might say, like, why would you do this then, right? Simple. Peer pressure, okay? Uh, on this trip, I was the youth pastor, right? I was the oldest guy on the trip. At the time, I was like in my mid-20s. I was the oldest guy. I was leading a trip. I know you can't believe that. And, and they had found out that there was bungee jumping nearby where we were staying. And I was the only one of age to be able to do it. And so they started pressuring me. Nick, you got to go bungee jump. You got to go bungee jump. So sure enough, there I was getting ready to bungee jump. Now, if we can go back to that first picture, to, to just demonstrate how terrified I was. I know I look like I'm smiling, but see the guy behind me? So within seconds when this photo is taken, he goes, okay, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, right? He says, I'm gonna count down from three, three, two, one, and I'm gonna shout bungee, and you're just gonna jump out. Okay, cool. So he goes, three, two, one, bungee! And I stood there. Like, I totally, how humiliating. I was like the eighth person to do this, not with our group, but like, I was the only one. I froze. Like, a minute, it took like a minute more for me to muster up. I was like, okay, now I'm ready. Now do it. And I finally jumped, and I brought a photo to prove that I'm not that much of a coward. I did it. I got dunked in the Nile River. It's that third photo. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but I was scared. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And I've often looked back and reflected and thought of how scared I was and thought, man, that's, that's like the perfect illustration, at least in my life, of often what it feels like to trust God. Like there are so many times that I look back in my life, times that I was filled with fear when God was saying, ready? Three, two, one, trust me, right? <laughs> and I was, if I'm honest, like I don't want to do it, right? Scared fearful. Well, thankfully, you and I, if you can at all understand being scared of trusting God, we're not alone. In fact, experts say, I don't know if you know this, experts say that the number one sign that you struggle with fear and anxiety is that you have a pulse, right? Like, we all struggle with, at times, fear. And we're not alone. Again, all of us, but even the disciples, those closest to Jesus that walked with Jesus, there was this one time that he told them to get out on a ship and go across some water. A storm hit the waters, and they panicked, fearing that they're going to die. And they said his words, their words, I quote, Teacher, don't you care that we're all going to die out here? Right? And if you think about it, Jesus, right, towards the very end of his life, he's getting ready to go to the cross, and we're told he's in this garden, and he's sweating blood, fearful unto death humanity, Jesus, standing before the will of the Father, was, was fearful. So this week, I've been really, well, really, the Holy Spirit has been leading me in some soul searching and, and really looking back at these times in which I don't trust God and wondering, why, why is that? Like, why don't I trust God? And I, I came up with a few. Number one, maybe you can relate to this. I've been let down by people a lot. I don't know about you, but the longer I live, the more I realize, like, very few people can truly be counted on. In fact, the more I realize I can't be counted on all the time, right? I'll never forget one time I was at this concert, and you remember when stage diving was cool? I don't know if it's still cool. I'm getting old. I don't go to as many shows, you know? And I got up on the stage. I was so amped. I was so excited. And I kid you not, I jumped off into the crowd, and nobody caught me. 
Like, I hit the ground in pain, and I was like, that's not how that's supposed to go, right? I mean, we've all probably been part of a trust fall that went bad, right? <laughs> a trust fall gone bad. I have. See, people have let us down. So it's natural. We're so used to people letting us down that it becomes a challenge and sometimes scary to trust a God that, by the way, you can't see him, right? You don't see God. Another reason I have a hard time sometimes trusting God is because I don't understand what God is doing. It's like the first time I looked at an ultrasound pic of my son, my first child, and the doctor, you know, brings it out and he's like, see, there's his leg and there's his head and his... No, dude. Right? I was like early 20s. There's no way there's a human being in this photo. I couldn't see it. And sometimes God's plan, it's, it's the same way. I don't see, I don't get God's plan for my life. It feels like a big puzzle, right? Sometimes my life feels like a big puzzle with pieces that there's no way this piece fits in my puzzle. Especially when I go through hard times, when I go through pain. You go, nope, that one doesn't belong here. Right, God? There's no way this piece fits in my puzzle, God. Not only that, not only because we've been let down and often we don't get what he's doing, but I'm super impatient. I think for most of us, all it would take to reveal how impatient you are is to be on slow Wi-Fi, okay? Like, I can't stand slow Wi-Fi, right? Like, just watching something load, it's already too slow. Like, we're at the day and age where it's like, it should be instant. Instagram, when it's like loading, I'm losing my mind. Why aren't you already there, right? Like, I don't know. Have you ever tried to log on to Obi-Wan's internet? Like, the worst internet ever. Now, I work here. I kid you not, last week, you can ask everyone that works with me, I was like so ticked off, it was so slow. I packed up my stuff and I said, late. I'm going home where I have good internet. Okay, you need internet. We're impatient people. We want it now. I play Fortnite with my son all the time. Okay, so if you play Fortnite, you'll get this. If not, you just tune me out for a minute. You got a moment to think about lunch. Okay, uh, we play Fortnite all the time, and my son, he's he's got a, like a developing problem with anger. Okay, because he he frequently like when he dies in Fortnite, he throws his controller. He's one of those kids, right? I'm working on it. Okay, pray for me. But he always like whenever he throws the controller, almost inevitably, you can guarantee he's gonna say, "My dumb ping." Anyone know what, what that is? Okay. The, the ping is how fast your like internet is. And so in his mind, the reason he's dying all the time is because his internet is slow, throwing his controller. It's the ping. It's a glitch, right? We're impatient people, especially when we consider God says that a day for him is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. I, you know, like, there's a lot of verses I like in the Bible. I don't like this verse, Right. Because like sometimes we feel like we're waiting on God forever. I'm 35, and God, how come you haven't brought a wife for me? It's been forever, right? And God's like, dude, relax. It's been a few minutes in my timetable, right? Like God's timing is super different than ours. And then the last thing I came up with is because it might shock you, but I like to be in control. We, we like control of things. I think that's what's so terrifying about bungee jumping is I have zero control. Like my whole life is resting on the strength of this elastic rubber band, right? It's not a great feeling. I found this article, I just picked out a few things off this article that it said signs you're a control freak. One that I thought was funny, it says you repeatedly press the elevator buttons to get there faster. <laughs> like, oh, I've done that, dude. I love this one, you split the check for everyone at the end of a meal. You know, like the waiter usually does that. You're like, no, I got this. And then the last one I thought was funny was you Facebook stalk a date before going out with them. It's good. These are just a few reasons that I think sometimes it's, it's, it's being honest, three, two, one, trusting God is scary. And, and why I think it's so important, why God deals with this topic throughout the scriptures so often is because fear snowballs into other things, doesn't it? See, fear for me often snowballs into, like, confusion. And I mean, like, crippling confusion. Like, I can't understand what God's doing, so I just am crippled by it. Like Habakkuk, he's a prophet, a minor prophet. Listen to some of his words about what God was doing in his day. 
He says, God, how could you choose the Babylonians for your judgment? You can't be serious, God. Why aren't you doing something about this? You can't condone evil. So why don't you stop this? Haven't you been there? Like, God, how could you allow this? Like, this is incompatible with what I understand of your nature, God. Why are you allowing other people to prosper, not me? Don't you know, I, I go to church more than I pray more. I go to the women's Bible study. How is her boyfriend cuter than mine, right? But let's be honest, like even a raise at work, you're like, I'm a better employee. God, where are you, right? We get confused. We don't understand God. And then confusion often leads to doubting God. See, now, now we're sinning. Like, I, I don't think fear is bad. But now, often for me, it leads to doubt, where now I, I, I'm just doubting God's ability. Like, I think of Sarah. Remember Sarah? Abraham and Sarah, they're like the, the, our grandparents of faith, right? And God had promised that he was going to make of them a great nation. But what's crazy is God waited till they got super old for them to have a child, right? So listen to what Sarah says in Genesis chapter 18. And I'm reading it from the message because it's, it's so good in the message. It says, Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. And Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband? <laughs> I love that. With this old guy? There's no way, God. Right? We, we've probably been there. Maybe you didn't say it out loud. God is good all the time. He's going to fulfill every promise. Yes and amen. We sang it at church. But inside you thought, maybe he's going to do it. And then I, I think where this gets really ugly is in my life, I go from fear to confusion to doubting to hurt, to hurting myself making decisions based out of a lack of trust and a lack of confidence and a lack of faith in God, right? Like think of Jonah. Look, look where not trusting God in fear led Jonah, the belly of a whale. Think of Adam and Eve. Wasn't, wasn't that the first sin? It was doubting the promise of God. They, they couldn't trust God. Satan said, did God really say? Putting doubt. In fact, I have a scar right here from when I was just a little kid. It, it was happening. I was like five years old. We were at a pool. I, I didn't know how to swim yet. And I'll never forget. My dad was just standing at the edge of the pool. It was deeper waters than I could stand in. And he was inviting me to jump in the pool. And I had my big orange floaties on. Remember those things? And I got to the edge of the pool and I was relatively excited. And I jumped towards my dad's arms. And at the last second, I panicked. And I turned towards my mom who was sitting next to the pool and hit my chin on the edge of the pool. Most of us have scars of those bad decisions that we made when we were filled with fear. God was calling us, three, two, one, trust me. So this morning, what we're going to do is look at three things in God's word, three truths that I believe are, are so, somewhat of like the bungee cord of faith, right? Like these are three truths that we should constantly remember we're tethered to. Things about who God is and the way he works. And there are things, and I'm not promising after today, Nick's, I think he's promising, I'm going to leave here today and never fear again. And No, no, no. That's, that's not what we're doing. But, but I believe God wants to continue to grow all of us. Like this week, I feel like God shifted me. If I'm like at a seven out of a million, I just went to eight, right? And, and being able to trust God. And I think God wants to take us deeper where there's less confusion, less mistakes, etc. Okay, so let, let's dive right in. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. We'll read, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, so look at Daniel's reading the Bible, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Okay, so pause real quick. Pastor Julian's done an amazing job the last weeks discussing kind of the context of the book of Daniel. But as a simple recap, Daniel 
because of the children of Israel, the Jewish people having disobeyed God for so long and not keeping the Sabbath, God had kept telling them, obey me, obey me, do what I tell you, it's for your own good. And they kept rejecting him and rejecting him. And God prophesied, he told the prophet Jeremiah that as a result, they would go into captivity and it would be for 70 years. So here's Daniel. He's reading at this point in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was deported by King Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC, which was about 67 years prior to this event, okay? And he's reading Jeremiah. So I had you turn, Jeremiah chapter 29. That's the context of Jeremiah chapter 29. When God is telling the children of Israel that he will bring them out of captivity. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. Let's read together. I'll read it to you. It's not on the screens. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. So, so Daniel's reading something that was written way before it took place, the 70 years, and he's reading that, oh wait, God's not going to leave us in captivity forever. 70 years, it's been 67 years, so anytime God's going to do this, right? Now, now, verse 11, these are where the three truths are, okay? So if I already lost you, Try to come back, reel you back in. Okay, these three truths, these are the, 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 the three strands that make up that Christian bungee cord, so to speak, okay? Number one, we read in verse 11. And we're going to read it in the message. I think we're going to have it. Yeah, there it is. And because I really feel like this is a great translation of what the Hebrew says, okay? And it's so different than the way I heard it growing up, okay? Reading it like in the King James Version, okay? So this is verse 10. This is God's word. We just read that. As soon as Babylon's 70 years are up and not a day before, God says, I'm going to show up and take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. We just read that. So there's the promise. I'm going to come back and bring you guys back. Here's number one, okay? Look what God says. I know what I'm doing. See, the way I'd always heard it growing up, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, Sounds kind of like a riddle. This guy's like, what does that actually even mean, right? What God is saying about himself is, look, I'm not second guessing. I'm not making like a pros and cons list. I'm not faking it till I make it. I know what I'm doing. I've got this all planned out, guys. That's what Daniel's reading. Like, God, he knows what he's doing. See how that that immediately, as soon as I I just remember that, how it helps me when the three, two, one trusts and I'm scared and I'm confused and maybe today you're doubting and you're hurting and God's saying, I got this. I know what I'm doing, right? See, because God knows everything, right? Like, I don't know about you. I'm still blown away by my GPS on my phone. Like, it's, it's amazing to me that I can just type in an address, especially when I moved to San Diego. I didn't know where anything was. And it knows the traffic. It knows possible construction and weather and all of these things. It combines all this data and within seconds says, this is where you got to go. But God, he knows literally everything. And so he's saying, I know what I'm doing here. Like, if you're trusting your GPS to get you from A to B most of the time, God said, I know what I'm doing. I got this. I literally know everything. So that, that's the first strand, okay? That's the first truth that you got to remember who is holding you. It's the God that knows everything and he knows what he's doing. He's not figuring it out as he goes. Hmm, what should we do today? What's the next step in his plan? No, he knows. Okay, number two and three. Here it is, the rest of the verse. I know what I'm doing. And now God's going to tell us what he's doing. For all of us, I have it all planned out. Here it is, number two. Plans to what? Take care of you. See, the original Hebrew word is shalom. Have you heard that word before? Sometimes it's translated peace, right? But in context, what's really being saying is God's not just saying, I'm going to give peace. I'm going to actually take care of you're my people. Number two, and then number three, not abandon you, but right here, what is God up to? Plans, and I love the way the message translates this because it's very accurate to the Hebrew. Plans to give you the future you hope for. It's, it's not two separate things, a future and a hope, which many of us have always read. Like there's three things, plans of good, not of evil, future, and a hope. But really in the Hebrew, it's pretty clear that this is what God is saying. Hey, children of Israel, Daniel, the very thing you're hoping for that I'll do, I'm going to do it. 
I know what I'm doing, and I'm taking care of you, and I'm going to bring you to the future that you're hoping for. So I want to read quickly verse 12. I don't know if it's going to be on the screens. Jeremiah chapter 12. This is what God says right after that. Then you will call on me, come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So what do you think Daniel does after reading this? Praise. Let's get back to Daniel, right? He just read all this. So, okay, God, you know what you're doing. You're going to take care of us. You're going to bring us back to the land after 70 years. And you said, if I pray and seek you, you're going to respond. I'm going to find you. So look, Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. He just read it. So I turned to the Lord God, and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition in fasting, in sackcloth, and ashes. And then verses 4 all the way through verse 19 is a prayer. We're not going to have time to look at every verse here, but basically let me summarize what David's prayer is, Daniel's prayer is. It starts with acknowledging that God is a just God. He acknowledges that, God, we got ourselves into this mess. (laughs) And then he turns to confession. He starts confessing to God, myself and my people, we have all sinned before you, God. And then he ends, listen listen to the end, and this is where I want to pick it up in verse 19. Listen to the desperation in Daniel's prayer. I can relate to this. Daniel 9, 19. Lord, listen. Have you ever cried that out to God? Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, God, and this part right here got me, don't delay. (laughs) God, where are you at? Because your city and your people bear your name. He's crying out to God. Now, the next few verses, God hears the prayer. God answers by sending the the angel Gabriel, who we've read previously in the book of Daniel. Let's read verse 20. It says, While I was speaking and praying, and I'm confessing my sin and all the sin of my people Israel, and making requests to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer. You might want to underline that. Sometimes we think, like, I got to keep praying, keep praying before God hears me. No. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel the man who I'd seen in the earlier vision came to me swift in flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Verse 22. And he instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. God's like, I'm going to help you understand what's going on, Daniel. Verse 23. As soon as you began to pray. There it is again. Man, we need to pray more, don't we? (laughs) As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Okay, now, these next four verses, this is the meat of Daniel chapter 9, okay? And if you've been in the church for any amount of time and you've studied Bible prophecy at all, these next four verses have been called the backbone of biblical prophecy, okay? I mean, this is gnarly stuff, and we could easily geek out here for like the next six weeks and really get into prophecy. But again, the Bible wasn't written for information, but transformation, and we only have 30 minutes, right? So, so we're, we're trying to focus on what, what's the gist, what's, what's God trying to teach us for us here now today, okay? But you need to know these next few verses are prophecy, Okay, and I'm going to try my best. God grant me strength in the next six minutes to summarize some of the most important words written in the Bible. Okay, but it is prophecy. But let me let me start by just giving you an overview of what this prophecy is. It's it's actually three different prophecies in one. Okay, the first thing is God is going to give Daniel a timetable of exactly how long it's going to take for their people, God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, to actually make it back to Jerusalem. They're in Babylon. They're scattered. How long is it going to take to get back, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls? He's going to give them a timeline. The second prophecy extends further. He says, after that happens, looking way down the road, there's going to be the Messiah, and I'm going to tell you when the Messiah is going to come. Okay, this is crazy stuff. Watch, this is amazing. And then the last prophecy, which we'll probably spend the least amount of time in, is a prophecy yet to be fulfilled, okay, for all of us here today, where God is going to ultimately rule and reign on this earth. 
But again, let me summarize. What, what's the take home before we get into this prophecy and nerd out for just a few minutes? God is saying to Daniel, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I got it perfectly mapped out down to, the, and we'll see, to the day, to the day. I know what I'm doing and we'll ultimately see that God, it's because I care for you and I'm bringing you to the future that you hope for, that all of us have hoped for. Okay, so let, let's get into it. Verse 24. You might have to put your thinking cap on for just a few minutes, okay? Seventy sevens. You might want to circle that. Super, super, super important. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, meaning I'm going to deal with your guys' rebellion and your sin. I'm going to bring you back to the land. But, but that's the time frame. Seventy sevens to put an end to sin and to atone for wickedness. So children of Israel went back to Jerusalem, but it didn't put an end to sin, correct? So this is still future in, in Daniel's day. To atone for wickedness, and then here's the future promises, even for us today, to bring in everlasting righteousness. To, we're not living in everlasting righteousness, would you agree? Okay, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. And the temple is not been restored and the sacrifices are not taking place today for the Jewish people in Jerusalem. Okay, verse 25. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one. Who's the anointed one? Jesus. The ruler comes. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench but in times of trouble. And after, verse 26, the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. Okay, maybe your brain hurts right now, okay? But, but let me try my best to simplify what's here. And I brought a chart. Uh, we want to go ahead and put that chart up on the screen, okay? But the time frame that God gives Daniel for these three prophecies, it's going to be fulfilled, he says, in 70 sevens. Now, it's almost unanimous. People that have studied this throughout the ages, scholars, theologians, biblical people that study biblical prophecy. The sevens, and in Hebrew, when we read the word weeks, we always think of weeks of days, right? Seven days. In the Hebrew, that's not the case. Weeks doesn't refer to days, months, years. So really, all of this prophecy only works. And again, most people believe that 70 weeks refers to 70 sets of seven years. Follow me? Okay. So if you do the math, which 70 times 7? You're like, I failed math. I hate math. 490. Boom. God just dropped some science. Look, I'm going to bring you back to the land. I'm going to bring in Jesus. And ultimately, I'm going to bring in my everlasting kingdom. And it's all going to happen in 490 years. You're like, wait, Daniel was written how long ago? Hasn't it been more than 490 years? Yes, we'll get there. Okay. So first thing, simplified. The first seven weeks... What's seven times seven? Seven weeks of seven years. It's 49 years. Now, this happened, as verse 25 said, when the command goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem. That's the beginning of our timeline. It'd be 49 years or seven sevens for that to happen. Now, that decree happened in 444 B.C. by Artaxerxes Longimanus. Okay? you studied your Bible, you know that's the book of Nehemiah, who Nehemiah led a group of people back home to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls in 52 days. And over the course of the book of Jeremiah, about 49 years, all of the city has been rebuilt. That's crazy, right? Okay, that's just, that's just, the, that's just the start, okay? Now he says the seven weeks plus the 62 weeks, which is at the top, 69 weeks, 483 years from that decree up until Jesus shows up, and as we read in the scriptures, and is cut off, what does that sound like to you? Death, Death okay, is going to be 483 years. Okay, now, it would be unfair for me to make it sound this simple, okay? There are endless volumes of books discussing this stuff, and not everyone agrees with what I'm going to say to you. What I was telling Pastor Julian even right before in between services is that ultimately we all end up at the same place, Jesus, okay? But there's this one guy in particular, and I brought his book. 
He's an old dude. Well, he's dead dude now, okay? He lived in the late 1800s. He was a assistant commissioner of the police department in London, uh, turned theologian, pastor, okay? He wrote this book called The Coming Prince. His name is Sir Robert Anderson. Best name ever, right? He was actually knighted for this work. He spent most of his life studying this chronology, this timetable. And here's what he came up with. He basically, using biblical prophetic years in the bible we see often references to a 360 day year 483 times 360 years he came up with the number of a thousand 173,880 days and the math's pretty simple you go from uh art exerxes long decree 444 you count 173,880 days later he came up with the day april 6 32 a.d the day that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey to die. Like, that is crazy. You see what God's saying to even us today? I know what I'm doing. You see, Daniel, he, he was looking forward. I don't even know if Daniel, like, fully understood that. Like, the angel was like, hey, I want you to understand something. Daniel might have been like, huh? Right? Because the first time I read it, I was like, huh? But we now look back and go, oh, God did that. Like God actually foretold the exact day that Jesus was going to come to die for all. That's crazy. So that's the second. And then you'll see on the graph, there's this gap. I don't have tons of time to get in this, so we're going to skip the gap, which is where we are now, okay? In the last seven, so we just talked the 69 sevens up to Jesus, and then the last seven, as this prophecy details, is a part of time in our future that the book of Revelation spends a lot of time talking about, known as the tribulation. It's seven years, right? And during that time, a lot of stuff's going to happen. But ultimately, and the point of this text is at the end of that seven year, the tribulation and the Antichrist, Jesus is coming back, riding on a white horse with the name King of King and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. And he's coming back to rule and reign and entering us into the millennial reign where Jesus brings an everlasting righteousness. See, prophecy screams to you and I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and this is just a few of them. The Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, I encourage you to pick up some of this stuff about prophecy. There's over a thousand prophecies, most of which have been fulfilled already. And people have tried to just take in the historical prophecies. I read one author, he took 118 it's actually a great book, A Skeptic's Search for God. He was not a Christian. He, he started to see there's all these prophecies that are historical prophecies like the one we just looked at. And he tried to calculate what is the probability of just 118 of these biblical prophecies coming true. And he ended up saying that the probability of just 118, and there's thousands, right, would be like winning the lottery 17 times in a row in one year. That'd be a good year, right? <laughs> Or he says, I like this one even better, being struck by lightning 24 times in a year. That would be a bad year, right? <laughs> it's impo mathematically impossible that, that God could declare all of this beforehand. Well, it's mathematically impossible, but God, all things are possible, and he knows what he's doing. See, what, what I hope doesn't happen is, is you leave here in a few minutes. Go, wait, Nick promised me that when things are tough, when I'm scared and confused and doubting, that God is knowing what he's doing, and he's taking care of me, and he's going to bring me to the future hope, right? That I, the thing I've been hoping for. And when I get home, I better have a Ferrari in my driveway. Well, obviously, not what the point is. Because, see, this is what, what we're being taught, and what God's constantly teaching me is, is Nick yeah, I'm taking care of you now today. I truly believe that with all my heart that God is taking care of all of us in ways that we don't even know, okay? And I truly believe that God can heal anything that's happening to you right now today in a second. But it would always be just a glimpse of what we really long for. Because Lazarus, yeah, he came back from the dead, but we, we sometimes seem to forget, but he still died. He's got a little bit more air on this earth. But it ultimately led into what God is ultimately accomplishing all of this 
is to restore what we lost in the garden, which is perfect communion with God, perfect fellowship with God, where everything is perfect, and we're not let down by anyone anymore. We're never confused because we have perfect minds now. We have perfect bodies. Can't you wait for that? And the thing that we really hope for, yeah, you might hope for healing today, but you're still going to die. Because what you're really hoping for is to always be whole. What you're really hoping for is to never be confused ever again. To never have to fear if I'm going to be cared for. And that's what that third prophecy is all about. Yet future. And for some of us, you're, you're in between the promise. Yeah, Jesus came and it was prophesied and all these other prophecies. But still some of the prophecies still yet to come. And, and what God is saying, I knew what I was doing and I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to bring you to the future that you hope for. And that future church is so great that the Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and it hasn't even entered into your heart. How incredible the things are that God has planned for you. Yeah, we might fear. My prayer is, God, we doubt less. We confuse less. I hurt myself less. <laughs> Ultimately, this, this isn't home, right? The Bible says we're just passing through in Hebrews 11 that we're just pilgrims on this earth. Now, when I travel, don't get me wrong, I, I like a nice hotel, right? I don't spend, I don't get, like, get the Ritz. If you get the Ritz, it's great. But I'm lucky if I get like a $100 hotel, right? I don't settle there. That's not my home. This earth, this life, you're 70 years. You're in a hotel. This is all just temporary. You don't want to settle here. Just like Daniel knew, Babylon's not home. I'm waiting for the day. Yeah, Jerusalem would be great, but there's a greater Jerusalem coming forever when we will reign with the Lord. And there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more pain. That's what we're waiting for. Don't forget, God's three, two, one. No, I don't want to. He knows what he's doing. He's taking care of you. And today and now, he's bringing you the future you hope for, and even greater, ultimately, perfection. I want to close with a story. It's a story of a, of a pastor, and he had been at a three-day conference, and he was getting ready to fly home, and you probably know the feeling when the fastened seatbelt light comes on. He just started the flight 15, 20 minutes in, and the stewardess says, uh, hello, yes, passengers, thank you for flying with us. Uh, unfortunately, we have a storm approaching up ahead. We ask that everyone fasten their seatbelts. So everyone fastens their seatbelts, and we all know that feeling. It's kind of scary, but okay, here we go. Well, about 15 minutes later, nothing had happened, and they hear over the intercom again that they said, uh, we're almost at the storm, and therefore we're not going to serve, be able to serve the meal. Remember that when we had meals on airplanes and <laughs> I miss those days. I sometimes think they said there was going to be a storm just so they didn't have to serve us. The meal. Anyways, so there he is and the storm's coming. Finally, they hit the storm and the thunder is so loud as they're traveling through this storm that it's able to be heard over the jets of the airplane. Not only that, the lightning is, is piercing through the clouds, and people on this plane are panicking, right? Have you ever been on a plane where, where you're hitting serious? I have, flying to El Salvador, like, I was freaking out, okay? People were screaming literally out loud. So that, that's what's happening. The planes, people are crying, doing the sign of the cross, praying, right? And he sees this girl in a window seat, smiling. She's got her book. She has her window open, and she's looking out with a big smile. This just perplexed the pastor. And once the plane landed, they got there safe. He finds the girl and he asks her, uh, little girl, why didn't you seem bothered, scared, and you seem so happy? And she said, oh, it's easy. My daddy's the pilot and he's bringing me home. And isn't that what God is saying to us today? I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get you home. 